Chapter 14, Principles of Disease and Epidemiology. So in this particular PowerPoint, we're going to go through a lot of definitions, and that will help launch us to the next chapter where we'll talk about mechanisms of pathogenicity. So here goes, um, and uh, the, the quiz will kind of reflect the term and the definition. So the way that I would uh, lay this out would be to somehow easily associate the definition with the term. So pathology is the study of the disease, but etiology is what causes it. Pathogenesis, the birth of the disease or the development of the disease, and infection is where it colonizes in the body. So you could have a sinus infection, and that's going to be obviously in the nose. A disease is an abnormal state. So you want to have homeostasis at all times. And when homeostasis is off and you can't get back to where you were supposed to be, then that is a disease. Do we have normal microbes in our body? Yes, we do. And we need them and they coexist with us and they co-evolve with us. And one of the biggest normal flora is to keep the abnormal pathogenic flora from establishing a foci of infection inside the body. So um, yes, normal microbial flora, and we'll have a slide on it, and essentially your skin, your upper respiratory tract, your lower GI tract, your lower urinary tract, uh, all of that is normal. So normal microbes permanently colonize our body. Now, here we go with symbiosis. Symbiosis means you're in a relationship with something. And there are three types of symbiosis. There is, it, it, there should be mutualism in here. I'm not going to test you on it because it's not listed. But mutualism um, is when both are going to benefit. So the E. coli that's in your lower GI tract, uh, believe it or not, it loves feces. So you provide food for the E. coli, yum. And what the E. coli provides for you is protection against food poisoning organisms. Um, and then there's under symbiosis besides mutualism, there is commensalism. And that means that one is benefited, but the other isn't, but it isn't hurt. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to, I, I know an example of it in nature. Uh, I'm just blanking on it for microbes. Um, but for nature, I love orchids, I love plants. And if I could get transported to the tropical rainforest, I would find the orchids just hanging from very high branches in um, the tropical rainforest. And the tree doesn't get hurt at all from the orchid hanging there. Um, the humidity is like 100%. But the orchid can get its nutrients from the moisture in the air, but it needs sun. So it needs to be high up. Um, so that's commensalism, where it helps the orchid, but it doesn't help the, uh, or it doesn't hurt the, the tree. Okay, so um, and, and here we have mutual. Sorry about that. Why didn't they put mutualism first? Anyways, mutualism is both on, or organisms benefit and in parasitism. That's when we talk about microbial diseases or pathogens. So the pathogen is just fine. You wouldn't believe what a wonderful host we are. We give them food, we give them oxygen, we get rid of their waste products, we make sure that the temperature is right, the pH is right. I mean, really, died in winter, microbe heaven. Um, but we suffer because they're pathogens and they cause disease. So they're thrilled, uh, I'm not, and that's parasitism. That's another type of symbiosis. Um, so what I would say is that they are um, mainly the normal ones are mainly mutualistic and some are opportunistic. But we don't perceive opportunistic bacteria because they're just dealt with with the immune system. People with AIDS, 
do have to deal with opportunistic pathogens um, and because their body doesn't have an immune system that just 24-7 deals with these. All right, here we go. Where do you find normal flora? Upper respiratory tract, lower respiratory tract, lower urinary tract, and skin. Okay, so normal microbiota. Why do you want them? They are going to protect you against pathogens. They can produce acids, which are bactericidal. Now, they obviously don't produce so many acids or so many bacterial sins that they're going to affect themselves, but they're trying to create an environment that would inhibit the attachment of, let's say, food spoiling, uh, not food spoiling, but food poisoning bacteria. Um, probiotics are big right about now. You can go to any stores from CVS to Whole Foods to Donlin's to Market Basket and buy probiotics. So if uh, you're in a situation where it seems as though your microbial flora in your gut is not terrific, uh, then you can ingest probiotics, which are claimed to be uh, able to repopulate your gut so that it is now um, productive and normal and beneficial. All right, classifying infectious diseases. A symptom is a change in body function that is felt by a patient, where a sign is a change that can be measured. And a syndrome is a group of signs and symptoms that accompany a disease. So Down's syndrome is an example of a syndrome because the baby when it is born with trisomy 21 down syndrome um, we tend to just think about one aspect of it and that has to do with intelligence however when you have a third or you, when you have an additional copy of chromosome 23 you tend to have other things the baby can be born with a heart defect the baby can uh, and that's in addition to uh, the um, uh, the mental IQ, um, the other thing could be gastrointestinal problems, muscle problems, um, bone problems, things of that nature. So the child tends to be born with a group of um, disturbances or diseases that come with the trisomy twenty one. So you we don't talk about Down's disease, we talk about Down's syndrome. All right, communicable means it can spread from one person to another. Contagious means it easily spreads from one to another. And non-communicable diseases, let's say like rheumatoid arthritis, that is a disease that is not transmitted to one host to another. So autoimmune diseases are a good example of that. You don't you, you, there's no way that a person with lupus or Down syndrome or diabetes type 1 can give you that. That's a non-communicable disease. All right, so this is now going to get a little bit into epidemiology and epidemiological terms where you're talking about a population. The population could be your town, the population could be your state, could be you know, um, a continent, whatever. So an incident is the fraction of a population that contracts a disease, um, usually a specific time. So you can talk about influenza viruses, which tend to be in the winter. And you can talk about the incident of the influenza. Where is it? Um, how many people are contracting that disease? The prevalence is the fraction of population having a specific disease at a given time. Sporadic disease is the occasional uh, upswing of that disease in a population. Endemic means that it's always there. So um, you could have, uh, in some cases, Lyme disease be endemic. So if you're in the south and you don't have a winter, then Lyme disease uh, is something that's always there. It's just you either... Um, 
you know, come in contact with that tick, but the tick is always there because the weather is such, the climate is such that it is endemic. Now, epidemic is the disease acquired by a lot of people in a, in a given area in a short time. So again, in our neck of the woods, you can think about a flu epidemic, pandemic, a worldwide epidemic, and I love this word, herd immunity, um, has nothing to do with cows, but it says immunity in most of the population. Uh, there's been a lot of controversy about vaccines. Um, the absolute wonderful thing about vaccines is if all children are immunized, then they create herd immunity. So if you have um, a population of children vaccinated, and that's 99.9% .9 of them, and 0.1% come into the population and they're not vaccinated, the chances of their getting the disease is very low. And that has a lot to do with the fact that they are surrounded like a herd uh, of children who are vaccinated and therefore would not be would not get the disease and be able to communicate the disease so herd immunity is one of the things that comes about when the majority of children people are immunized against a disease so if there are people who are not but they have to be very rare um, but they are protected by the herd all right an acute disease is a, a, a rapid Development of symptoms, chronic disease develops slowly and persists over time. Subacute, uh, that's when people very often will say, I really feel rotten, I feel tired, and, and blah, 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 blah. And then the next day, bam, they uh, come down with the flu or they come down with a cold. Um, the day before, it's subacute. They they know that they're feeling lousy, but they don't really know why. And then usually subacute gets to be acute. Uh, latent disease is going to be um, a disease with a period of no symptoms when the patient is inactive. All right, And then just like subacute tends to then become acute, latent tends to become active. Okay, local, in a particular part of the body, systemic, throughout the body, focal infection. Focal is the uh, where in the body it originated from. So uh, you have a um, maybe a wound in your leg, and that is focal, and then it became systemic and caused septicemia. So, um, so there are two words, bacteremia and septicemia. Bacteremia is finding bacteria in the blood, and septicemia means it's growing in the blood, and this can be quite deadly very quickly. Okay, the extent of host involvement. Toxemia, toxins in the blood. Viremia, viruses in the blood. Primary infection, uh, that little pathogen that got the whole thing started. Secondary infection what comes about because of primary infection. So people can have the flu and some individuals, and that's an upper respiratory tract infection, and some people will have a secondary infection um, during the flu or, or sometimes very soon after the flu of pneumonia. And pneumonia is a lower respiratory tract infection, but it came about because of the flu. Subclinical means um, that there are no noticeable signs or symptoms yet. And what can predispose people to disease? Well, let's see, urinary tract infections is common in women because they have a tiny little urethra. It's only about two centimeters. Guys have their urethra thread to a penis, which is larger and therefore don't have as many urinary tract infections. Uh, inherited traits like sickle cell anemia, uh, climate and weather, uh, bring on winter. Okay, uh, if you're fatigued, if you're stressed out, as you grow older, uh, lifestyle, that goes without saying, and what if you're on chemotherapy? Chemotherapy tends to be very 
um, compromising of the immune system. And that then sets the people up for things like infections that are easily or easily develop in a person who was on chemo. So stages of a disease. So here we go. This is time. And then this is the number of pathogens. And so it's a bell-shaped curve. And the incubation period, and this is a period where the person doesn't know yet. And it's without signs and symptoms. Um, and sometimes the, the person feels off, but nothing nothing that, that they can actually point to. Mild signs and symptoms are called prodromal, uh, the period of illness. And then if the immune system cannot resolve it, if drugs cannot resolve it, the person could die during this period. Uh, if they are responding, then there will be a period of decline and a period of convalescence. Reservoirs. Uh, what reservoirs mean is that the pathogen can hide out uh, in different cells or different organs or different organisms. Uh, and the cells or the organ or the organism is, they don't get sick. Um, but if you um, have it, then go to an organism that's susceptible, then they will get sick. So, um, and AIDS, AIDS, the virus can hide out in fibroblasts. And the fibroblasts are fine, but they have this unholy alliance that they allow the HIV virus to remain viable inside of them so that you put the person on chemo and they seem to be fine and the viral load goes down and then all of a sudden the viral load goes up and it's like, well, well where did it come from? And it came from the fibroblasts. Um, for here for uh, carriers that um, might carry it that are um, not cells in the person's body, you can have animals carry it. So if you're bitten by a rabbit um, bat, then that bat is carrying the rabies and the bite will infect you. Um, and there are, um, you know, some of these like the Lyme disease when you get bit by a deer tick that has the Lyme disease. Uh, you get Lyme disease. Non-living uh, can be in the soil. You can have spores of Clostridium botulinum. And then if you maybe have a wound on your foot and you then have the spores enter that wound, you can develop botulism. Same thing with Clostridium tetanus. You can develop tetanus. Transmission by direct contact. So you have someone who um, is going to uh, be able to directly, uh, let's talk about HIV and sexual contact. Indirect spread by fomites. So that's going to be something that's infectious that um, the person handles. Um, droplet infection, that could be airborne. I love that. That's a great, great picture. Uh, a vehicle is a transmission by an inanimate reservoir. So every summer, um, it, you tend to um, find articles on Legionnaire's disease because the Legionella pathogen exists in air conditioning water tanks it's inside of big buildings. On top of the big buildings, you have these water tanks. And that becomes a favorite place when it's summer and everything heats up and air conditioning is used a lot. And then through the AC, you can actually have the um, Legionella pneumophila um, become aerosol. And then you breathe it in. And if you're a susceptible person, you come down with Legionnaire's disease. Uh, vectors, ah, uh, this time of year, deer ticks, uh, mosquitoes can obviously cause disease. Um, mechanical, uh, arthropod carries pathogens on feet, what I never knew, and that's creepy. And then biological, 
pathogen reproduces in a vector. So the vector could be a mosquito. Um, and so the mosquito um, bites, let's say, um, I'm, I'm thinking about malaria. Uh, the mosquito could bite an elephant that is a reservoir for the plasmonium paras parasite. And then that's going to bite a person and the person comes down with malaria. Okay, nosocomial infections are required in a hospital. So this is showing you that people are sick, they're in a hospital. Um, there is some microbes in the hospital because other people are sick. And so they're more susceptible to getting that. And this is the frequency. I'm not going to test you on it, but if you're curious about which ones can cause nosocomial infections. Emerging infectious diseases. Um, right about now, Ebola is a problem. Um, there can be others that have um, been emerging infectious diseases in the U.S., like hantavirus. Sometimes the new strains mutate. You've got yourself a new strain of flu or a new strain of cholera. Sometimes it emerges due to uh, bad practices in the issuing of antibiotics. And some can emerge during the summer, during the winter. Hantavirus was an outbreak because of rain in a desert, and that was quite unusual and it set up a whole sequence of events that caused Hunter to spread. Okay, so this is epidemiology. Um, it, when you are studying epidemiology, you tend to make graphs. And these are just examples. They're not going to be on the quiz. And I do want you to know about the CDC, the Center for Disease Control because that's where we get all our information from. Uh, uh, the CDC has many, many branches. So if you want to know about an emerging disease, you want to know about a prevalence of a disease, the CDC will have that free uh, website to die for. So mortality is death, but morbidity is the incident of a specific disease. Uh, so again, a mortality rate is the number of deaths in a population at a given time. And morbidity, however, is the number of people affected in a given period of time. So we might talk about the morbidity rate of Lyme disease this time of year. Um, but it doesn't mean that the people who get Lyme disease are going to die of it. So that's the difference between the two. And that's it. So I will see you soon for the next chapter. Take care.